So the devotees invited me for one of these darshans. And uh, I, at one of the darshans, I asked Prabhupada. It was a, a Gargamuni had um, requested Prabhupada to sing the Chintamani prayers, which Prabhupada had done very beautifully. And uh, asked afterwards, he asked if anyone had any questions, so I raised my hand. And at the time, I was, um, I was, um, the draft board was, you know, a problem for every one of us at that age. So I was very concerned about whether or not I'd be drafted because America was at war with, in Vietnam. And so I asked Prabhupada um, to describe what the spiritual world was like. And he said to me, uh, he looked back and he looked at me and he said, in the spiritual world, he said, the spiritual world is a place where there are no draft boards. <laughs> and he told a story, he said, there was once a uh, Christian minister who was preaching in England to coal miners. And uh, he was describing the hell that awaited someone if they didn't accept the shelter of Jesus. And uh, he said that uh, hell is a terrible place, very, very dark, very dank and cold and wet. He said no one would want to go there. So all the coal miners were thinking, well, if that's hell, you know, where are we? We're already in hell. It doesn't sound very f fearful for us. This is where we live now. We're coal miners. So then the minister was trying to think of a way to convince them to take to begin worshiping Jesus. So then finally he said, in, in uh, hell, there are no newspapers and there's no tea. And then they all said, oh, then we must worship Jesus. So Prabhupada said, so in the spiritual world, there are no draft boards. He said, is that all right? <laughs> I said, yes. Everybody said, jai. Prabhupada had a system of keys you know, for keeping his, he would, you see, Prabhupada would keep a key under his keychain, under his wristwatch. This was the key to whatever, wherever his belongings were kept, his valuables were kept. So, he'd never part with this key. But because thing, he was becoming very ill, you know, I was always, you know, desiring that Prabhupada would take me into his confidence. So one day he really gave me an ultimate confidence in letting me hold the key. This was a key to his desk drawer. So uh, I had the key and then, you know, naturally, what would I do but lose the key? So I came before Prabhupada. Prabhupada asked for something. I, I didn't tell him right away. I mean, I scoured Hare Krishna land. I went everywhere looking for that key and I could not find it. I had people looking all over that place. And finally Prabhupada called for something from the desk and I went to Prabhupada and I said, uh, Srila Prabhupada, I have to tell you something. Prabhupada was laying down because he was ill. He said, yes. I said, Prabhupada, I lost the key. Prabhupada said, call the GBC. I said, which one, Prabhupada? He said, call the whole GBC here to decide what should be done. I went, oh, God. He said, call the whole GBC. So I just, there was nothing I could do. I just walked out and I decided, okay, I'm going to call the GBC here. He wanted to call the whole GBC body to Bombay to decide what was going to be done with me, I guess. I don't know what the... So then I got this, you know, I was just besides myself and suddenly I thought, let me try another key. And, you know, sure enough, it was an Indian lock. <laughs> I just got another key and somehow or other I opened it up. And I ran the Prabhupada. I said, Prabhupada, I said, uh, I, I, I said, uh, I opened it. I opened it. He said, how did you open it? I said, I found another key. And he thought, and he said, that means the lock was not very good. He said, then... It doesn't matter if you lost that key because it's not a good lock. So then he said, you know, now put the key on your Brahmin thread. 
He made me put the key on my thread to put the thread through it and put the key in. He said, don't ever lose this. But he had a very interesting way of keeping the key. This key was a key that opened up a safe. The safe had a key that opened up his Almira. And in the Almira, in, under a special place was the key that opened up the safe in the Almira. Four keys. It had a whole key system. One key led to another key that led to another key that finally led to the key that opened up the safe. Prabhupada had a lot of systems. Another thing he had me do is that every, every key had to be labeled and there had to be a, a, a log of all the keys, an index of all the keys. And not only was there an index of every key, there was an index of every item in every Almira. He wanted everything systematized. This was an Indian system. Just like you go to India, every seat, every desk, you know, is gazetted, is numbered. This is the go Indian government. Prabhupada did certain things, like Prabhupada told me, we must, you have to keep all documents for seven years. He had many things he learned from the Indian government. He always used to quote about the Indian railways, you know, that just said, keep the wheels moving. He said that was a good motto for ISKCON, keep the wheels moving. The first letter I wrote to Prophet was all about Sankirtan. I told him what the results of Sankirtan were. See, what happened was that Prabhupada told us all the brahmacharis to get jobs because Jayananda was supporting the temple single-handedly. Prabhupada said it wasn't fair. So he said all the brahmacharis should go out and get jobs. So, you know, everybody did what they knew best. I remember Vishnu John, he decided that he was going to make flutes, bamboo flutes, and he used to stand on Haight Street, and he made all the flutes so that they played Hare Krishna. And he would just stand out on Haight Street playing Hare Krishna all day. And he said oh, he was a Brahmin. And he told me that I, would, I was a Sudra because I went to work for Kodak. See, Gurudas was working at Kodak, so Gurudas got me a job at Kodak, and it was a very, you know, one of these uh, high-tech high jobs. I would get the uh, film canister and break it in half. That was my job. <laughs> break the film canister, put it, break the film canister. And then when they saw that I was really capable of doing that, they moved me up to a higher position where I would run the uh, film through a heating elements and it would be developed this way. And then I would get to bring it to Gurudas, who was in the dark room developing. He got a bigger salary than I did. So you can imagine what this was like. But still it was yoga, and I felt it was yoga. I'd give the whole check to the temple, and every day I just you know, looked forward to the lunch break. I'd immediately go out, I'd have my little lunch, and uh, I'd go out and with Gurdas and take lunch, and we'd have some kartals and do some kirtan. And it was the only thing that saved me was that lunch break. But after a month or two of this, it was unbearable. Gargamuni went to... Uh, to Mon Montreal and talked to Prabhupada and Prabhupada said that if they don't want to do this then let them go out on the street and do chant on the streets. So we had an Istagosti and uh, we discussed this and I volunteered that I would organize it because I wanted to get out of that job. So <laughs> I was very eager to, or I was ready to do anything to get out of that. Uh, Prabhupada um, gave Gayatri Mantra First, I, I think he did it first in Boston, and then he came to San Francisco and gave some of us Gayatri Mantra. It was September 1968. So, um, you know, he gave out a sheet with the Gayatri Mantras after teaching us how to chant. Anyway, Jayananda was having some difficulty pronouncing the mantras, so he decided that he should go and ask Srila Prabhupada how to properly pronounce the mantras. So he took me along with him. And um, we sat down in front of Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada told him to go ahead and try to pronounce the mantras. And as Jayananda tried to pronounce the mantras, Prabhupada just leaned back and started roaring with laughter. <laughs> and Prabhupada just shook his head and said, it's hopeless. <laughs> He said, but it doesn't matter. He said, because you're so sincere, Krishna will accept it. Krishna will accept your chanting. How Prabhupada is so learned. Um, we're told that Prabhupada, first of all, I mean Prabhupada is an intimate associate of Krishna. 
So the Dhamma Buddha Yogam Tum, Krishna gives the intelligence uh, to his surrendered devotee. And I think the first answer is that it's by the grace of Krishna. Prabhupada knew everything because he knew Krishna. He knew exactly when to quote a particular verse and, you know, that was appropriate at the time. We were also told that Prabhupada did study Bhagavatam during his Grihastha Ashram, for example, for four hours every day. Hmm. I heard this. And um, I also heard talking to Prabhupada's son, Vrindavan Chandra, who told me that Prabhupada used to personally worship Radha Krishna deities. He would um, not only worship the deity in the morning by waking the deity, offering arati, bathing the deity, uh, but he would also uh, cook for the deity personally, and he would also sell the deity's clothing. In other words, he really took care of those deities. Um, so Prabhupada, you know, he, he, he did many things. I mean, one point is that what we know of Srila Prabhupada, we know from what we saw of him, after he came to America, but we don't know everything that happened before that, and we certainly, as Prabhupada said, you, you are seeing me, but actually, in other words, Prabhupada has his, uh, you know, how Krishna and he are related is something which, you know, so Prabhupada was able to hear from Krishna everything he needed to know. I, I think it's not only, it is, on the one hand, I'm, I'm trying to say that it's both a question of his studying but at the same time, it's also a question of Krishna's re revelation to Prabhupada. I don't think you know, it's, it's one or the other, but it's a combination of both. One time, Prabhupada gave me a love do. I think I told the story last time, yeah. A love lu, actually. It wasn't a love do, it was a love lu, as Prabhupada called him. Uh, anyway, uh, and uh, he asked me what my impression was, of it was, you know, and I, and I, uh, I, I tasted it, and I just, couldn't believe the taste. I said, it's not of this world. Papa said, you're right. <laughs> he said, this is, the, this is the same recipe that Mother Yasoda cooks for Krishna when he goes out to tend the cows. And Krishna likes them so much that he keeps extra in his pockets so that he can eat them throughout the day. You know, and I was... I mean, uh, when, I, when Papa was speaking, it was very clear to me that, he, you know, it was Mother Yasoda's recipe. <laughs> And Prabhupada knew it very well. I was with Prabhupada when we made some of the recordings. He made some of the recordings, um, which are, you know, we listened to bhajans. And um, it was quite wonderful to watch Prabhupada record. First, he would play the harmonium. And, um, well, when I was there, I'd play the kartals, or if I wasn't there, someone else would very gently. And uh, try to keep the rhythm because there was no Madanga because after he would record the harmonium the cartels then he would put on the headphones and he would listen to the recording and just play the Madanga to accompany himself so a lot of these tapes are proper playing harmonium and Madanga and uh, I mean, Prabhupada was an expert musician. I, I heard that uh, maybe uh, I think it's mentioned in perhaps in the environment but anyway it said that when the recording engineer heard the uh, chanting that Prabhupada did on the Happening album, the first Hare Krishna album, Prabhupada, the, the man said it was, you know, Prabhupada was uncanny, that where Prabhupada was perfectly, had perfect pitch, perfect pitch. When the recording engineer was very, very impressed with Prabhupada's voice. One thing that I, rec I always remember is how Papa once laughed at me. I mean, he laughed at me quite a few times, but this is one time where we're in Calcutta. We had just arrived. And, uh, you know, I think, I don't know if I mentioned, I was traveling with the whole party with sannyasis. Did I mention it? Except for myself. At the time, I was a grihasta. And um, the whole uh, entourage of Srila Prabhupada consists of sannyasis. <laughs> you know, Kirtananda Swami, Madhavisa Swami, Devananda Swami, Kartikeya Swami, and Tamal Krishna Das Adhikari. <laughs> so, 
I had enlisted myself, you know, we had just formed, the Prabhupada had just formed the GBC, and because I was there, I immediately grabbed the zone that I knew Prabhupada was going to. You know, it was just a smart move to, <laughs> to get to be with Prabhupada. Little did I know what, you know, what it all was all about, GBC, and then I didn't know what I was setting myself up for. But it was the right move, because for the next four years, eight months of the year, Prabhupada was practically, I think, eight months of the year, on average, he was in India, so it was the right move. But it, I had to pay for it. <laughs> but anyway, I started paying as soon as we arrived in Calcutta, because um, Prabhupada instituted the life membership program. And uh, little did I know that, you know, when you keep accounts <laughs> in India, it's for real. You know, when you keep accounts in America, it's not really, now it's for real, but in those days, we were so small that it didn't matter what we would have done or didn't do. And anyway, we were tax exempt. But in India, you know, everything's for real. You, got, you have to keep track of every paisa, literally. So, you know, Prabhupada was, he instituted the life membership program, money started to come in, and, you know, someone had to keep the counts, and someone had to keep tabs on who the members were, and issue receipts, and print up membership books. And every time I try to get someone to help, they say, I'm a sannyasi. I'm a sannyasi. You know, I play the harmonium, I, every one of them was doing something. I'm practicing harmonium, but nobody was supposed to do anything because they were sannyasis. So finally I was going out of my wits, you know, I really couldn't, I, I just couldn't, I, I went practically, I went mad. After about two weeks of this, I ran the prop and I just broke down. I said, I can't take it anymore. He said, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, I can't take it anymore, I can't. I said, you know, I said, nobody's helping me do anything, I have to do everything. And Prabhupada looked at me, and what I'd never expected, he just started laughing at me. <laughs> and I was crying, and he was laughing. So he started laughing, and then he said, actually, he said, this is the same position Arjuna found himself in. He said, Arjuna found himself in the same position. He said, this is very good. You know, I was, trying, I was hoping for sympathy. Actually, I was hoping for some assistance, at least some sympathy. Instead, Prabhupada starts laughing at me, telling me it's very good. So, you know, I just, you know, I stopped crying, but I mean, I was trying to figure out why it was very good, and he said, we should pray for this situation. He should, said, we should pray to be so constantly engaged in Krishna's service that Maya cannot find us any means to enter. I said, you are very, this is very fortunate. Then, you know, once he told that story about an Indian train, said, if you've ever, I mean, especially if you go on a train in India, like I used to have to go constantly from Mayapur to Calcutta. It's a local train, and it's packed. And I mean, you know, you have to go to countries like India or China to know what the word packed <laughs> is like. Or maybe South America, they get packed up there also. But any, let's say any third world country, can you know what the word packed means. So, Prabhupada told a story about, you know, how you're sitting on a train, and uh, you have a nice seat. And this little skinny guy comes up, you know, and he's looking, you know, trying to figure out how he's going to sit down next to you, right? And, you know, you just try to make believe you don't, you're you not seeing him. But you know exactly what he wants. He wants to sit down. There is no room. But eventually, you know, he just sort of smiles at you and then plops down. And he wiggles around and gets in between you and the next person. So then you sort of, like, you know, you sort of, uh, you know, you have to make some room. And then suddenly, you know, he calls over his little kid. And he sort of pushes you and gets his kid down. And, you know, you're moving towards the edge of the seat. And then he brings another kid and he gets three or four kids. And then he's got this huge fat wife. <laughs> and then she comes and then you just get up and give up your seat. And it all started because, you know, this... You maybe had a little sympathy and let this guy get in. And Prabhupada said, in this way, if you allow Maya to, even an inch to enter, she knows how to come in and take over everything. He also confirmed in 1977 at his Vyasa Puja, I was enumerating Prabhupada's, you know, some, just a few of Prabhupada's outstanding accomplishments. And at one point he said, yes, he said, whatever I'm doing now, he said, I am simply doing uh, he said, I learned uh, from the time when I was a child. 
from my father. He said, everything except one thing, book publishing. That I learned from my Guru Maharaj. And it's interesting that when I gave this lecture, because actually it was, a, it was interesting, Vyas Puja, because Prabhupada was ill, but so basically it, the Vyas Puja glorification section was my talk. And somehow Prabhupada, in the, in, you know, Krishna empowered me actually to speak for 45 minutes on that day about Prabhupada. And it, it wasn't, Prabhupada just had me speak. It was in London. And three times only Prabhupada interrupted. And each time it was to say something about, and my Guru Maharaj ordered me to print books, or and my Guru Maharaj ordered me yeah, to publish books, to publish books. Three times he interrupted my lecture to insert this point that my Guru Maharaj ordered me to publish books, to distribute books, three times. Everything else was fine about the lecture, but somehow he wanted three times more emphasis on the book distribution. Very interesting. In London, of course, that was another interesting negotiation. Uh, Prabhupada told us, I got to London in, 19, in, 19, uh, in September of 1969, and uh, by that time Prabhupada was getting ready to get the place in Bari Place, Seven Bari Place. And what is a temple without deities? So Prabhupada gave us the instruction that we need to, you have to install Radha Krishna deities. But he didn't order the deities, and we didn't have any deities. He just said, the such and such December so and so was the date of the opening, and you have to have Radha Krishna deities. So we, you know, started to go. It was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. How are you supposed to find Radha and Krishna in London? We just started to ask anyone and everyone. It was like a, you know, a national alarm. Anyone knowing the whereabouts of Radha and Krishna? please phone such and such number. And that was the number of Mukunda's wife, Janaki. So, well, it went, you know, week after week went by and Prabhupada would call us and say, where are the deities? And we said, you know, we don't know where Radha and Krishna are. Prabhupada said, you have to have deities. So finally, miraculously, when we were practically giving up, we get this phone call. Janaki gets a phone call. Someone says, we have Radha Krishna deities. So immediately she informed Mukunda, and Mukunda and I went down to this man's house. And the man took us into his study, and he said, I have some Radha Krishna marble deities. Would you like to look at them? So, you know, would we like to look at them? You know, we were ready to jump out of our skins, practically. Sure, we wanted to look at them. And he took off the cloth, and, you know, we just uh, offered our obeisances because that was Radha London Ishvara. So uh, we said, they're beautiful, they're so beautiful. I mean, they were beautiful. And he said, well, I'm considering that I may be willing to give them to your temple. So we said, well, we have to, you know, can we bring our spiritual master to see them? And he said, yes, you can do so. So we raced out, and we went to a phone booth. I remember we called immediately to Prabhupada's apartment. Prabhupada was living near Regent's Park, very nice apartment. And um, we called up and he was resting, so we decided just to go over there. We went in and we told him, Prabhupada, we found Radha and Krishna. So Prabhupada Amina said, take me, I want to see them. So we had a van, we used to have a van. And uh, it was Prabhupada and Mukunda, Shamsundar, and myself, maybe Gurudas came in the van and we went in. And by that time was the early evening, Prabhupada came in and he started to talk with this Indian gentleman, in a very friendly way. The man said that these deities were ordered already for society, but somehow or other things had not worked out, there was some difficulty, and they could not use the deity. So Prabhupada would just ignore the point and he just kept asking the man, where are you from? How are you? How's your wife? He made the man bring his wife in, bring the children in. Prabhupada, you know, gave his blessings to everyone. Just talking, talking. And finally the man, you know, said, Swamiji, don't you want to see the deities? And Prabhupada said, oh, yeah, yes, we can see the deities. It was just so nonchalant as if he was not even interested. So, uh, you know, he said, please, I want to show them to you. you know. So he took the man, the man took Prabhupada over and... Um, he showed him the deities, 
And Prabhupada looked and said, hmm. And he just turned around and walked and sat back in the sofa. So the man said, um, wow, so Swamiji, I, I mean, what do you think? Can you use the deity? Prabhupada said, man, they, they look like they may be used. He said, well, uh, you know, I'm thinking I can give them to you. Prabhupada said, yes, we could, we could accept them. And uh, he said, uh, he asked me, go and see how heavy the deity is. So I went over and Shamsunda went over and uh, I tilted Radharani and I said, not very heavy. And she was heavy, but I said, not very heavy. Shamsunda had Krishna. Prabhupada said, uh, all right, we'll take them now. He said, pick them up, and we just, and then the man said, wait, wait, Swamiji, wait a moment. And I think maybe he had an idea of recovering some of the cost. I don't know what he had an idea. He said, wait, wait. And he said, no, 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 there's no problem. It's not heavy. These are American boys. They're very strong. And we carried the deities out, and uh, the man was just protesting. Swamiji, Swamiji, went one minute, and we walked right out to the van and brought Radhakrishna, put them in, and Prabhupada sat down in the seat next to the driver's seat, and uh, he said, you know, I'll take care of the deities. We'll be in touch with you. And the, and the man just, you know, the whole family was out there and they were just like this. And Prabhupada said, okay, let's drive. So we drove off and when we got around the corner, Prabhupada said, stop the car. And then uh, we stopped the van and Prabhupada said, take the cloth off the deities. We took the deities and Prabhupada just started to offer prayers. There were tears in his eyes. And he started to sing the prayers from Brahma Samhita. He said, Krishna has now appeared in London. In India, there was, of course, the um, Hare Krishna land affair, purchasing of Hare Krishna land, which we now have our big Radharas Bihari temple on. Uh, Prabhupada uh, was advised about this land by one devotee, Tusta Krishna. Prabhupada was in New Delhi at the time and came down. Tusta Krishna had made friends with one Mr. Nair, who was the, um, I think, owner, huh? He was the owner of Indian, no, Free Press, Free Press Journal. Free Press Journal, yeah. Anyway, um, it's a very long story, which uh, as long as Giri Raj Maharaj will be writing in detail about it. He's writing a book now about this. Uh, but, um, it took, you know, Prabhupada we got into a negotiation with him. And after a long time, we signed a sales agreement. And this sale agreement, um, Mr. Nair had really no plan to fulfill the agreement. And uh, after a certain amount of time, it ran out of time. The sale agreement ran out of time. And we could not sign the conveyance, which is the final document of change of title. So uh, a long, long, long period ensued in between in which Mr. Nair tried to remove the devotees from the land. It's a very, I mean, it's a big history of part of the history of this kind. And there are many heroic battles that were fought. Prabhupada said it was like Kurukshetra. Um, so um, even to the point of the temple, the temporary temple was demolished. Prabhupada had installed Radha Ras Bihari at the Bombay Pandal, and then he put the deity there and he prayed to the deity, my dear Lord, now I'm requesting you to sit down here and I will arrange everything for you, but don't leave. And Prabhupada made this promise to the deity. And, you know, so many things happened trying to get the deity and the devotees off the land. And wherever Prabhupada was all over the world, this was just constantly in his mind, you know, Hare Krishna land, Hare Krishna land, Hare Krishna land. So finally, Prabhupada came back and, you know, the, after a long tussle, again, we were in Hyderabad. And uh, Prabhupada arranged for Mr. Nair to come to meet him. We were staying at the house of one Mr. Panaval Pitti, a very wealthy man, the wealthiest man in Hyderabad city. And uh, Mr. Nair came with his guru who was some type of a pseudo-guru. And the purpose of bringing his guru was that Mr. Nair felt that Prabhupada had some type of mystic power and he would put some spell on him and, you know, take the land. 
So after uh, a big dinner, Prabhupada was yawning, and Mr. Nair and his guru immediately said, Swamiji, I think that you must be getting tired. We should let you rest. And Prabhupada said, I'm very tired. So he retired, and immediately Mr. Nair and his guru went to sleep in the next room. So after about five minutes, Prabhupada's secretary called me into the room. Prabhupada wasn't sleeping at all. Although Prabhupada always slept after eating, everybody knows this, but he wasn't sleeping. So Prabhupada said, what are they doing? <laughs> so I said, uh, they're sleeping. He said, go in there and wake up Mr. Naya, but don't wake up the guru. <laughs> so I went there, you know, to the side of the bed and I shook Mr. Naya's arm. Mr. Naya, went. I said, Prabhupada wants to see you. Shh. You know, and I, I pointed out your guru sleeping, don't wake up your guru. So I took Mr. Nair in the room and Prabhupada just started to preach to him. And, you know, Mr. Nair was just sitting there and he's listening and listening and gradually Prabhupada got him to agree to sign the agreement all over again. And he told Shamsun and me, immediately go in and type the whole agreement out. So we went in and we started typing on the mechanic, you know, that, you know, typewriter, old typewriter Prabhupada had typed it out, Prabhupada got it signed. And by the time he finished signing, you know, the guru got up, you know, and he came in, and Mr. Nair, you know, had signed away the land again. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mr. Nair just kept hitting his head. He said, what have I done? You know, what have I done? Prabhupada said, it's okay. Sushi Guni Thai Ki. Sushi Rupini Dorpadish Ki. Sri Jagannath Baladeh Subhadra Devi Ki. What do we do? Keep. Yeah. Is there an RT now? Or? Organizers? Yes, you can go to the All right. So, uh, you know, but it was done. There was nothing that could be done. So at that point, Prabhupada sent us back. We had to accompany Mr. Nair back to Bombay. And we took this old flight, hopping flight, it was bouncing like anything, propeller plane. Myself, Shem, Sundar, and Mr. Nair. Anyway, as it turned out, the lawyers, our own lawyers, were actually working in cahoots with Mr. Nair and Mr. Nair's lawyers. And so, within a period of 10 days, they convinced Shem, Sundar, and I that there was the greatest blunder to go ahead with this contract. So, once again, you know, this is another fatal blunder. <laughs> We canceled the contract. We let it run out without fulfilling it. So Prabhupada, I think, was in Pune, and I called him up to tell him the good news. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, Srila Prabhupada, you know, uh, I wanted to call you to tell you. And he said, what has happened? Did you, you know, did everything go through? And I said, no, Srila Prabhupada. We canceled the uh, contract. And all I heard was click. Prabhupada just hung the phone up. Prabhupada came back. And then for the, about the next two months, Prabhupada would call in one member after the other, and he would wheel, you know, sort of parade me in. And he'd say, this foolish boy, and he'd show him the contract, and he said, he canceled the contract. He canceled the contract. You know, and I was going, anyway, this was such a huge blunder. So, uh, the thing I feel about these, and there were many, there were more such blunders that went on in time, but I think that the um, wonderful quality of Prabhupada through all of these is that he never gave up on a devotee or a disciple. No matter how many mistakes a devotee might make, he uh, wanted to see if a devotee would continue to want to serve Krishna and to serve him. Uh, in that instance, with the cancellation of the contract, Prabhupada did not reject me. He um, gave me the opportunity to go through, you know, a hellish year and a half after that with Giriraj Marsh, <laughs> where we had to go, you know, all the time into Bombay, sitting in the lawyers' chambers, and uh, just trying to rectify the situation. So it's a... Um, symptom of Srila Prabhupada 
that he never gave up on a devotee. He said about Krishna that when you chant Hare Krishna even one time sincerely, that Krishna will never leave you alone. So I feel uh, the same way, uh, that Prabhupada never leaves you alone. Uh, even you may make many mistakes in his service, still he does not reject you. But he accepts you just as a father would accept a child, a parent accepts a child. He expects that there may be mistakes, he will chastise you like anything, but he never gives you the sense that he doesn't love you. So despite all of the grand mistakes that were made, I never got the sense that Prabhupada loved me less because of them. And um, I, I always felt encouraged and never felt discouraged, even when, you know, these mistakes occurred. Prabhupada had a devotee there who was a Sikh by birth. He joined us and Giriraj Swami and myself, and this devotee, uh, his name was uh, Chaitanya, Chaitya Guru at the time, Chaitya Guru. So he was uh, driving us around and we would be going making members and collecting money to build the Vrindavan temple in Bombay. So after a while this devotee somehow got it in his mind that he should go off on his own and leave and make his own way spiritually in life. And he took up living on Juhu Beach with one bogey yogi with the intention of learning the art of passing a coin from one ear out the other ear. <laughs> so before he had done this, he was already canvassing from our members, collecting on his own. So I had approached Prabhupada, the Srila Prabhupada, this person, we have to write something to our members to warn them about this person. So Prabhupada was a little hesitant to do that. Then finally, you know, but he, he was not ready to give up on this devotee. But when this devotee finally started to live with that bogey yogi, I said, Prabhupada, now it's reached the limit. You know, this person is on the beach living with a bogus yogi, trying to learn how to pass the coin from one ear out the other. <laughs> so I said that now, you know, there, it's the end, it's finished. And Prabhupada looked at me and he said, you do not know about Lord Nityananda's mercy. I said, why, Srila Prabhupada? He said, because there is no end to Lord Nityananda's forgiveness. And later on, sure enough, that devotee came back. And again, Prabhupada tried to help him. He gave this person sannyas even. And the person eventually left. That's an, you know, but I met him maybe a year ago, and he's still on some spiritual path of some type. But the Prabhupada was so clear, he looked at me, and he said, there's no limit to Lord Nityananda's mercy and compassion. So, Srila Prabhupada is the manifest representative of Lord Nityananda Prabhu. And uh, his forgiveness is like that. So I think that in terms of our, both our dealing with our own shortcomings, and in terms of dealing with each other, we have to always remember that Prabhupada never rejected a devotee. There's very, very, very few instances in the history where Prabhupada, you know, did so. It was very, 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 very... Another time when we were in India, Prabhupada was actually quite upset because um, some of his, or one, or one god brother, or some god brothers were critical of our sannyasis because they didn't speak Sanskrit or they couldn't read Sanskrit. Prabhupada said, where does it say anywhere that one must be able to read Sanskrit to go back to Godhead? Where does it say that? He's quite adamant about this. And he said, my disciples may be, it was at the same time, he said, my disciples may be disqualified in so many ways. He said, but one qualification they have, he was speaking to some Indian people in Vrindavan who would gather in his room. He said, but one qualification they have. He said, whatever I tell them to do, they will do it. They have full faith in whatever I say. So, I mean, I appreciated the point because compared with the, the gentlemen who were sitting there, there were many gentlemen and saintly persons. We certainly were not qualified in so many ways in terms of etiquette 
And Prabhupada, in fact, said that. He said, often they, I know often they make mistakes in terms of etiquette. He said, but whatever I tell them to do, they will do. So our good fortune was that we were following the Lord's pure devotee. And, um, you know, despite all disqualifications, that one qualification surpassed every, every good qualification anyone else might have. In the morning, I shaved my head. And when I came, Prabhupada, the first time he saw me, he came out of his uh, apartment and he looked at me and he saw my head shaved and he said, Ah, now you are an ideal brahmachari. He was very pleased that I had shaved my head. Because he had noticed all along that I was keeping short here, but I wouldn't shave up. And uh, I had joined with Vishnu Jan and he had shaved up before me, but I didn't shave up immediately. So when I finally shaved up, Prabhupada appreciated that. One time I asked Prabhupada on one of those morning walks, first walks I went with him, I asked him how many pure devotees were there on the planet. And Srila Prabhupada turned to me or to one of the devotees and asked, how many devotees are there in ISKCON now? He said, that is how many pure devotees there are. When we went to India with Srila Prabhupada, uh, 1970, at the time, and, and uh, leading up to that time, the Sankirtan movement had pretty much just begun <coughs> for a year, a year and a half, meaning active street Sankirtan. And it was done by, you know, chanting Hare Krishna on the streets and uh, distributing back to God in magazines, basically. So we get, when we got to India, we uh, applied the same formula we started to chant Hare Krishna on the streets. But as soon as we did that, there was some ridicule. People were ridiculing us a bit. And um, there were some newspaper articles, even. Uh, and people somehow were throwing coins towards us. When Prabhupada heard this, especially the people were throwing coins, he told us, stop immediately doing daily kirtan on the streets because people are taking it in a cheap way. Then gradually, um, things turned around a little bit, but it was significant that Prophet was willing to adjust completely a most fundamental strategy, you know, of, of streets chanting parties, if it did not have the desired effect. So, um, a preacher has to be an expert judge of time, place, and circumstance, um, and and you know know how to present Krishna consciousness in an effective in an effective way for the vocal population, and it may be uh, one formula may be you know totally unsuitable, <coughs> and Prabhupada did really uh, know how to decide which formula was suitable to which person. I think that was one of Prabhupada's most outstanding qualities. Uh, he wasn't a stereotyped thinker. He used to say, you know, it's, spiritual life is not static, it's ecstatic. You know, it's pun in that word, it's, it's ecstatic. And um, he was always thinking of, you know, brilliant, unique ways to spread Krishna consciousness. So we did about twelve dollars the first day, and I thought this. Is, and I went back to the temple. Gargamuni had a little shop, and I said, "Gargamuni, we did twelve dollars." He said, "Wow!" He said, "I'm going to give up my shop. This is big. This has huge potential." <laughs> he was ready to give up his shop. So uh, the next day, I decided to take back to Godheads with us. And when the people give a donation, I give them a back to Godhead. And the collections by the end of five days it had gone up to forty dollars. And I wrote Prabhupada day by day how it increased. And Prabhupada wrote me this letter and he said, don't worry so much about money. He said, if Krishna wants, he can give you the whole USA. The question is, what will you do with it? Do you know what to do with it? So it was a sobering letter. Prabhupada was very pleased with this Harinam party. He decided when he left San Francisco to open a temple in Seattle, Gargamuni and Upendra had gone there. And Prabhupada decided that the Sankirtan party should go with him. And at that point, Jayananda went to Prabhupada and asked Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, well, again, it was Swamiji at the time, he said, Swamiji, you know, I'd like to travel with the Sankirtan party. And Prabhupada said, but you are the president. 
And he said, I think this is more important. And then uh, Prabhupada said, well, what will you do? And he said, I'll be the driver. And Prabhupada thought for a second, he said, very good, you can go. And he was willing to, he thought so much about Sankirtan that he was willing to let the top devotee, the person who was maintaining the whole temple, who was the temple president, he was prepared to let him go to become the driver of the Sankirtan party. So Jaina had to join our party that way. So when Prabhupada came to San Francisco, he had wanted me to come back to India to take up my service again because he couldn't find anyone to replace me as a GBC. And so when Prabhupada was there, as soon as we got in the car, we picked him up, Prabhupada started talking about Hare Krishna land and India. And I was just, I could feel the pressure was coming down. So then we went into Prabhupada's room and Prabhupada had, you know, it was just myself and Prabhupada in the room. He said, so, you know, uh, what are you going to do? Are you prepared to come back to India? And I said, well, Prabhupada, I'm preaching now. And Prabhupada was a little upset. He said, what is that preaching? He said, preaching means there must be results. I said, though, there's results. He says, what are those results? Let me see really what are the results. So I had had all of our new men shave up and they all were completely fresh shaved, the 10 new bhaktas. And I had them each come up with a rose, and one by one, they came up and they put a rose on Prabhupada's desk, and they offered their obeisances, dandavats, and then they sat down, and Prabhupada started to beam, and he said, this is preaching. He was so happy to see this. He said, so you stay here. He approved it. We came through, the next program that Prabhupada was going to was in Madras, and we stopped, the train stopped from Ahmedabad to Madras, stopped in Bombay, but because my wife was now at the temple, and I was a sannyasi, I wouldn't go. So I sent my party to see Prabhupada and give a report. And I just sat in the train station waiting for them to come. It was a six hour or something wait over. And then suddenly Yadubara came and he said, Prabhupada sent me here to bring you back. He said, you can come to the temple. I said, but you know, my wife is there, former wife is there, I can't go, I'm a sannyasi. I said, Pra no, Prabhupada said, it's okay. So as soon as I came into the room and I offered my bed, and the Prabhupada said, the temple is a neutral ground. He said, it is neutral. You can be here at the same time. There's no harm. And then he asked everyone to leave the room, which was quite unusual, I thought. Because Prabhupada didn't generally do that. He asked everyone to leave the room, and he beckoned me over to the table, and he said, now tell me. Give me your report. So I gave him a report, and he was so happy about this preaching report, because I had just been in sannyasi, the first, this was his first preaching assignment he'd given me. And after it, he became so pleased, he stood up, and I had offered my obeisances, and he stood up, so I stood up, and he walked around the table, and he just took me in his arms, and he held me very tightly, he embraced me on one side, and then he embraced me on the other side, and he said, now, take this sannyas, sannyas mantra in your heart, and go everywhere and preach. He said, now, he said, Kirtananda is a sannyasi, Brahmananda is a sannyasi, and you are a sannyasi. Now I can retire peacefully and translate. Go and preach. And I was just, my whole body was so transformed, you know, I felt by Prabhupada's touch, because it was very rare that Prabhupada would use his body so much like that, too. And it was a real, you know, I really felt surcharged by that, empowered by that. And uh, then I went back to the train, and we went to Madras. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's, uh, I think it was appearance day. So I told Prabhupada that Srila Prabhupada, you know, can we celebrate this in the evening? Because then we'll have a lot of guests. Prabhupada said, no. It must be celebrated at noon. So it was on a Friday. I said, Friday evening, we can fill up the temple. He said, no, it must be at noon. So we celebrated it in the room, in Prabhupada's room. We, Prabhupada had a little room. This is La Sienica Boulevard Temple, L.A. Prabhupada had a side room next to the big temple room. So, uh, Prabhupada did all of the prayers and spoke about his Guru Maharaj. Then he said to me, how is the feast going? So I said, I'll take a look. It was about 10.30. So I went in. Nothing was done. There was no preparation. So I went back to and I said, you know, what is going on here? I started screaming at them. They said, well, you told us it was going to be Friday night. And I said, Prabhupada wanted it at noon, you know, and maybe it was my mistake. I might not have conveyed the message in any case. So I went back to Prabhupada and he said, so, how is it going? 
And I said, uh, there's nothing done. You know, Papa just looked at me, didn't say a word, got up, walked through, out of his room, through the temple, through the prasanam hall, and into the kitchen. He immediately got, told the devotees, get this done, get this done, cut this fish, what this... He cooked a feast in one hour for at least 70 devotees, personally cooked the whole feast, at least 12 preparations, within one hour's time. And he always told me, I always remember this, Prabhupada always said, deity worship is one hour's business, cooking is one hour's business. Cooked the whole feast in one hour. And I remember one of the best things I remember about it was the way Prabhupada made the puris that day. Because every puri puffed up. He put in the puri in the hot ghee, you know, and he would just touch it. And it was like he would touch them. I remember they would blow a little and he would touch them, even sometimes with his finger. They were just perfect puris. Then the feast was offered and it was brought out of Prabhupada's room after it was given to Prabhupada, the whole maha plate. Within about three minutes afterwards, it came out practically untouched. And we were all eating this big feast and we saw Prabhupada didn't eat and everybody went, oh. Prabhupada was very upset. But he still cooked the whole feast for his Guru Maharaj. He was determined that it must be, and he told him it must be offered by 12. But he was very disturbed. The first meeting we had with the whole group of members of Dainapan, the top chairman down, they all came and very formally they presented their cards to Prabhupada. I think this story is told in, in the Lilamrita. They all presented their cards and then they left and Prabhupada was left with one, you know, the number seven man to just show us off at the end. It was like a whole ceremony, it was like a tea ceremony, but we drank water. They drank tea. They were on one side of the big, big oak desk and we were on the other. So, Prabhupada had a word for, with the man before we went to the limousine. And he asked the man, what is, you know, your goal? And of course he had, Prabhupada had been given these calling cards by each of them. My name is so-and-so. My name is so-and-so. So that Prabhupada, that man took all the cards and put them in a, in a row, up and down, and he was number seven. When Prabhupada asked him what his goal in life was, he took the card number seven, and he went like this. And Prabhupada shook his head and laughed, and then he really, you know, started to preach to this man about the nature of life and how temporary it was, and that was not the purpose of life. So, uh, Prabhupada was a real transcendental negotiator. He had me be the heavy man, and Dainapan would give a price, and I would say it's impossible, and I'd give this ridiculously low price, and they would just practically start crying. It was so ridiculous, the price. And that we would get into a big argument, and Prabhupada would just sit there in a neutral position, and finally he would act as if he was the arbitrator. And he'd say, this is not good, this should not be quarreling like this. He said, I will settle it. He said, you know, neither side should argue like this. We must consider both the needs of each side and he would pick the price that he wanted, you know, which was still extremely low, but by that time they would just think that, you know, that Robert was their savior. And in this way, we went through all of the prices of each book, and Prabhupada uh, got very low contract prices. And he was very proud that he had been able to get $60,000 worth of business with a $5,000 down payment. He said, I have so much, they have so much trust and faith in my writing I had a habit, whenever Prabhupada would tell me something, I would always say, just unconsciously, I know, I know, I know. And one day Prabhupada said, you know, you know, you think you know everything. First, and I really, you know, it's like that, you think you know everything. Another time, Prabhupada had this system, when he did his construction projects in India, two signers on every check. Prabhupada was one signer and I was the other. There was only one problem when Prabhupada would travel out of the country. So one day I suggested to Prabhupada, why don't you sign some blank checks? <laughs> Prabhupada did not like that idea at all. He said, this, he said, this is my account. Is it all right that I decide how the money will be used? Is that all right with you? You know, I was suggesting to him that we could do different things. Pishima was adored and even worshipped 
by, especially by the lady devotees. One time we were going in procession from Calcutta to Mayapur and Pishama was in one of the rear cars. And uh, then she got out and all the women rushed there and they were doing, and Prabhupada said, what are they doing? I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, they, you know, they're, they have respect for her, you know, as they do in a way for you. He said, why? What is that? What has she ever done? She's just an old lady. What has she ever done? Prabhupada wrote me in a letter that I had so many opportunities for sense gratification throughout my life that I never, but Krishna always saved me and, for, uh, and I never knew what is meat-eating, gambling, intoxication or illicit sex and he said um, there was never, he wrote this and he said there's never a moment when I was ever forgetful of Krishna he actually wrote that in a letter to me so there's never a moment when I was ever forgetful of Krishna. Krishna Tirtana Banana Tanapano Premamritam Banihi Vira Vira Jana Priyau Priyapara one time Prabhupada would tell me, another thing he didn't like is that I would fall asleep sometimes. As soon as I get in the car, I fall asleep. So we were riding in the car, in the back seat I was sitting next to Prabhupada. And I, you know, I was just like this. So Prabhupada said, you are sleeping. So I said, no, Srila Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. He said, you are sleeping. I said, I don't think I was sleeping. He said, I said you were sleeping, you are sleeping. He said, chant Hare Krishna. So I started to chant, and I, you know, Prabhupada was chanting Japa very quietly, and I was going, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Hare. And then I, you know, when you, you know how you catch yourself and stuff? And I looked at Prabhupada, and just chanting. <laughs> Another time, Upendra was sleeping in the front seat, and he was going like this. So Prabhupada leaned over, and he very gently caught Upendra's Sika from behind. So when a pendra went like this, the seeker yanked. <laughs> and pendra turned around, he thought I had done it. He was very angry, you know. But it was Prabhupada <laughs> 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 quite a seeker. Prabhupada was in the early days. I was the, the Mott commander in Los Angeles, La Sienica Temple. Prabhupada called me one day. And he was uh, talking to me and he, he asked me to get the Bhagavatam. He had the Bhagavatam his original Bhagavatam, and he said the cover, you know, was a spiritual sky. And he said, you see this spiritual sky? It's very big. He said, you cannot fathom how big this is. He said, in this, the spiritual sky, one f three quarters of the spiritual sky, one quarter is the material creation. That material creation has innumerable universes. You know, one universe is so big the scientists can't measure it. And we're on one planet in one of those universes, out of innumerable universes, which are constituting one quarter of the creation. So on this one planet, Earth, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the smaller planets in this universe. He said there are seven continents. And on one of the continents, North America, there is a great city called Los Angeles. And in that Los Angeles city, there's a long boulevard called La Cienica. And on that La Cienica boulevard, there is one church building, which is now a Hare Krishna temple. And in that one Hare Krishna temple, there is one temple commander, and he thinks that he is very important. And I was, you know, <laughs> I felt so small. Prabhupada said, he thinks that he is very important. There is one Tamal Krishna, and he thinks that he is very important. I don't remember what it was that I did, but there was some foolish thing I did. And Prabhupada looked at me, you know. There was something about, the, I had forgotten something. And so I, I said, Prabhupada, I just can't remember. He said, yes, you cannot remember. He said, because there is nothing inside there to be able to remember with. He said, simply zero. Just zero. Whew. I thought, this is the final thing after all these years. There's nothing in there, you know. I said, oh, boy. Heavy chastisement. When we got to Rishikesh, Prabhupada was ill. And uh, we were staying in this house, Ganga Darshan. Very nice house. 
right overlooking the Ganga. Prabhupada had been lured there by uh, Nava Yogendra Swami, who told him, if you drink water, I think it was he who lured, if you drink water there, you'll get back your health. So as soon as we got there, Prabhupada told me, bring Ganga Jal. And I immediately put on my gumption, I dove off the second story of the building, because it was overlooking the Ganga, and I dove into the Ganga from the second floor. Prabhupada was getting his massage, and I went out with a loda and came back, swam back with the loda, brought up, and Prabhupada, right in the middle of the, you know, and he was not eating well at those time, this time, it was the last months, he immediately took a full, you know, glass of water, and a big belch came out afterwards, and Prabhupada said, ah, accepted. And he smiled, and he was very pleased with that. I was sitting, standing there dripping wet, and he accepted. So then he immediately ordered, go out and get kachoris, kachoris and jalebis. There was one shop very famous for making jalebis and kachoris in Rishikesh. And Prabhupada said, this hot jalebis is a remedy, cure, for a sore throat. He said, now it is a little cold, we must get hot jalebis. So we ate hot jalebis, and he said, this is, whenever you have sore throat, you eat hot jalebis. But must be made fresh hot. And another time, Prabhupada gave me the cure for, it was a very nice cure, isn't it? Jalebis, if they're made you know, nicely, are so tasty, and that's how you get better. Another cure he gave me was when you have dysentery. Hot puris and salt. The puris must be cooked in ghee. They must be right off the fire with salt. And sure enough, I had this dysentery. I took hot puris and salt, immediately cured, like a cork. His son was there, Vrindavan Chandra. And Vrindavan Chandra and myself were with Prabhupada. And Prabhupada started to remember his grihasta life. And then he started to say, he said, actually, he said, my wife was your mother. He said, your mother, he was telling his son, your mother was very good, very chaste, very devoted. He said, one could not ask for a better wife. He said, it was I. He said, I was not very easy. And he started to cry. He said, she was so good. And it was like he exhibited all of these apparently human qualities. And as a sannyasi, and he said, I should not say this. He said, I should not say it. But I could see it was just a way of healing any possible feeling which that his son might have had towards him for having left the family and taken sannyas. And it wasn't acting, but he just, he was very soft. His heart was so soft. But I liked moments like this where, you know, there were very extraordinary moments where you'd, it's so different than what normally Prabhupada showed in his official position. But they were so special and charming. About book distribution, Prabhupada said, big books are more important than soft backs. He said, hard back is more important than soft back. He was very firm about this point. Give out big books. He wanted more big books distributed. He always said that. And he really liked the Radha Dhamana Party. He said, the main thing he liked about the Radha Dhamana Party, he said, you have understood a very important point, that in the Kali Yuga, people don't come to the temple. You have to bring the temple to the people. That this was the whole idea about book distribution. Go out to the people. Prabhupada said very clearly that any way that they could come into contact with these books, he said even they just touch it, he said even if they look at the picture, if they touch the book, he said they, be they begin their devotional life. Therefore he told the book distributors, put the book in their hands. He said if they just touch the book, never mind even read, if they touch the book, it has so much power. We were walking in... Um Regent's Park in London with Srila Prabhupada and uh, actually it was uh, perhaps the month of October or November it was quite cold and uh, there had been some type of precipitation because the uh, walkway was icy Prabhupada had on a airline blanket which he was using to wrap around his waist on top of his dhoti. I'm sure Prabhupada didn't steal the blanket from the airline, but uh, somebody did. <laughs> In any case, it was a type of striped blanket of some type. I believe it was striped. Forget the airline. And there was a wool blanket. He would wear that. And um, it was just sure Prabhupada and myself walking 
then as we were walking through the park, Prabhupada was taking his stick and he was he would stop and he would smack the uh, puddle which had frozen. And then he would walk on. And then he'd come to the next one and he'd bang, smack it. And it would shatter. And after a while I I guess he was waiting for me to ask him why he was doing that. <laughs> so I asked him. You know. And Prophet said, because this is not the natural condition of the water. He said, somewhere it is not our nature to be in Maya. So we must break the back, you know, the material energy. And he said, this is not a natural condition to be in Maya. And I remember we kept walking and at one point there was some, um, I think it was some, he noticed that, a, that the, there was a lake of some type and it was frozen except for the portion around the trees. And he said the Goswamis knew this secret. That's why they lived under trees. He said because a tree is warm in the winter, underneath the tree is warm in the winter and cool in the summer. He said you can see that because around the tree the water is not frozen. Hmm. So Prabhupada had a very big appetite. He used to, he really relished prasham. And he would take at least 45, 50 minutes to take prasham. And he would eat alone. And he would chew and chew with his eyes closed. Chewing, chewing, chewing. And just really relishing prasad. When we went to India, of course, we got to eat with Prabhupada regularly. Because we would be invited. Prabhupada said, this is preaching. He said, we, he said, we make members by eating. He said, very good preaching. Because in Surat, when we went to Surat in Gujarat, he made a condition that he would only take prasadam if the person would become the life member. So we got 30 days invitation. He made 30 members. He said, this is preaching. Then all the devotees would sit together. Prabhupada would be at the head on their little chonkis, and we would all sit and take prasad. So it was very nice. We got trained to take prasadam with Prabhupada. Uh, Prabhupada was in a room in London, Bari Place, and he was appreciating the, the service of Jamuna Devi. Prabhupada said, I mean, Prabhupada glorified Jamuna Devi unlimitedly for her qualities and her devotion. Very, he, he once wrote her a letter that she was on the level of Bhava Bhakti. In a letter he wrote this very high position. And, uh, but one day he said to me, he said, if she weren't a woman, I would make her a GBC. If she weren't a woman, I would make her a GBC. Someone brought uh, ice cream from New Vrindavan to Prabhupada in, Vrind in Vrindavan, the final days. And Prabhupada took it right on a teaspoon and ate ice cream from New Vrindavan. They somehow they had dry ice, they kept it cold. And they brought him a ring they had made. And as soon as we showed Prabhupada the ring, he said, so, where is the bride? He said, where is the bride? Another time, a famous story, of course, where we had our Radha party and, you know, we were quite energetic. By the time that one year was over, we were giving 40% of the total proceeds to the BBT of the whole movement. Big party, but, you know, after a year and a half. But we were creating a, quite a bit of disturbance because some brahmacharis were leaving the temples, wanting to be with the sannyasis, and the sannyasis, of course, were saying it's better for brahmacharis to be with us than to be under these grihasta temple presidents. So by the time we went to India, we brought with us like 90 brahmacharis, Radha Damodar party. You know, we were we had the whole second floor, the third floor of the, uh, you know, Lotus Building, and we were riding the crest wave of success. Uh, you know, we had just given, I mean, it was huge. I remember the Christmas marathon was so competitive. Uh, there was such a heavy competition between California, Jayatirtha, and the Radha Dhamana party. I remember Ramas, and Ramas was right in between. He was a real transcendental personality, getting everybody to compete, you know, and I told him, you know, he, he kept saying, how much are you going to give? How much are you going to give to the book fund? And I said, I'm going to send you a check, and this is a blank check. I'm going to send it to you. Put it in Put it in your safe, and whatever they give, whatever the amount is, add 10000 and deposit it, and it will clear at the end of the month. And that was my challenge. We were very determined we were going to defeat them. 
So we gave, at the end, by the end, we gave $195,000 to the book fund. 195000 This was 1975 marathon, Christmas marathon. $195,000 to the book fund. One party. 190000 We did a uh, quarter of a million back to God. had 60,000 big books. It was a massive thing. So, but, you know, it just, people were getting so agitated. So when they came, all the temple presidents complained to Prabhupada. And, uh, you know, I was sitting in the room, and whew, Prabhupada was just looking at me. Then everybody left, and I just kept sitting there. I, I knew I better just keep sitting here, because I thought I better talk to Prabhupada alone. And Prabhupada just looked at me, and I said, oh. I said, I, said, I don't know what to do. I said, maybe I should just, you know, go, go to China or something. You know, it's like, I'll go to the moon. I just said like that. Anyway, I, I walked out. The next morning, right in the middle of RT, someone tapped me, you know, and I went up to my room. Trevor Crump came in. And Trevor Crump walked in the room. As soon as I saw Trevor Crump, it was either Trevor Crump or Hardy Street, I forget. Maybe it was Hardy Street. I said, I'm not going. I'm not going. He said, how, how do you know what's going on? I said, I'm not going. Somehow I knew those words, when I was in the Mongo Arti, I just started to think, I was thinking, what did I say? You know, what is going to happen? As soon as I saw Prabhupada's servant, I just said, I'm not going. He said, what do you mean? I, you know, he said, Prabhupada wants to see us. I said, I'm not going. It meant I'm not going up to see him, and I'm not going, <laughs> I'm not going to China. So Prabhupada came, you know, I came, finally I came up, I had to come up. And I was sitting there, and I think Guru Kripa and Manavisa were behind me. And Prabhupada was putting, he had just gone to the bathroom. First he said, I want you to go to China. I said, China? I said, Prabhupada, the Radha Dhamma party. I said, I have to be there. He said, no, I want you to go to China. And he walked out to go to the bathroom, take, you know, brush his teeth and freshen up for his walk. And he came back and was sort of putting on tilak, you know, he had his tilak, you know, Prabhupada would have the tilak mirror. And he said, I want you to go to China. And I said, but uh, I started to give ex you know, excuses that if, if I go to China, you know, what's going to happen to the party? Prabhupada says, don't worry about the party. And his, you know, bottom lip started to quiver. He was, I mean, he was shaking his hand. He said, don't worry about the party. I said, but, uh, you know, this, this is a very important service. Prabhupada said, then, he said, I take that service away from you. You have no other service to do now. Either you go to China, or you sit in Mayapur and chant Hare Krishna. There's nothing else for you to do. So Guru Kripa was sitting behind, he said, I'll go to China. Prabhupada said, no, he must go to China. So I was sitting there going, oh. Then I suddenly I realized, wait a moment. You know, all of the Radha Dharma party, everything is, is really meant for Prabhupada's pleasure. And if I go into China, Prabhupada will be pleased. My life is made. So immediately I just looked at Prabhupada and said, okay, I'm ready to go. And Prabhupada just beamed. And he took, we went upstairs because Prabhupada would walk on the roof, around and around, and he announced, Tomorrow Krishna Maharaj is going to China. And everybody went, Jai, Eddie <laughs> And Prabhupada turned this heavy situation, you know, into like a glorious act. So he was so expert. He never really said too much about the whole thing. He never said to me, people are complaining about you, this or that. He just, he found a way to correct an entire situation and open up something wonderful for Krishna. He found a way to turn what appeared to be a very negative situation into a very positive event. We had a tent. We had a tent city there. And Prabhupada had uh, paid 8,000 rupees through, uh, no, through Sagar. Uh, 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 Madhavis, I believe, went with this guy, Sagar Maharaj, who was a Gaudiamath sannyasi, actually, he had been rejected by the Gaudiya Mahaprabhu, but we didn't know it. And he told Prabhupada, he came one day, and he said, I can arrange it to Kumbh Mela. So he, I think Prabhupada sent Madhavisa with him. Anyway, they paid 8,000 rupees to rent the tents and everything, and we all set up, and we had a fantastic Mela, Kumbh Mela. Then everybody left to go to Gorakhpur, and they were all waiting at the train, and the only persons left at the campsite were Prabhupada and myself. We were going to go at the end in a rickshaw to the, to the train. 
So what happened was that this Sagamarsh cheated us and cheated the tent, you know, tent wallas. He didn't pay them the full price. So these huge guys, Sikhs, huge guys came in and they demanded from Prabhupada, you know, that he pay them the balance. And I mean, I was scared stiff. I mean, these guys were six foot something, you know, 200 plus pounds. And you know, little Prabhupada's frail personality. I mean, it was 1971, he was very strong, but still frail. Six, Prabhupada couldn't have been more than five foot six inches high, and I wasn't much more than that. And these guys were bearing down on Prabhupada, and Prabhupada said, no, we have given you the money, and we will not give any more money. And he was on and on talking with them all. And he said, no, no. And they were yelling and yelling. And were, I didn't know what was going to happen. And finally, Prabhupada said, he, he, he just got up. He took his cheddar, threw his cheddar up, and he said, let us go immediately. And he walked out, and they started following him, you know, screaming. Prabhupada called a rickshaw, got in the rickshaw, and said, go to the train station. And we just drove off. And Prabhupada could be very strong with this. When Prabhupada uh, struck that deal for back to Godhead orders, so then they served us prasanam. And I asked Prabhupada at that time, is there any, uh, can you give any special instruction on how to take prasanam? Prabhupada said, when taking prasanam, there are no rules. It is a matter of personal taste. I always remember this whenever I take prasanam with my godbrother Riddhananda Marsh, because he and I have of course, now we have the same prasanam taste, but for a while he was a special prasanam addict of certain types of prasanam. And I always remembered Prabhupada said, it is a matter of personal taste. Now, Prabhupada gave me some instruction. It's interesting. At the very final pastimes, 1977 in Rishikesh, Prabhupada again decided that he would t teach us how to cook. I don't know why it was, but we were all men there. Myself, Bhakti Chiru Maharaj, Yadubar, and Prabhupada decided he was going to teach us how to cook prasanam. And again, he taught me how to roll japatis at that time. And he taught us how to cook one preparation, badi chachari, which is a Bengali prep. Prabhupada said, the way you cook this prep is, you use all mustard oil. You cut up the portals and uh, potatoes and uh, chilies and put them in mustard oil. Drown them in the mustard oil and then put on a very strong flame and cook them until they burn. He said, when you see it smoking and the sound comes out, fuck, 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 that sound, bubbling sound, he said, then you know it is done. So when we went to Rishikesh, Bhakti Chumaj cooked this Bhadi Chatri and Prabhupada took it and then he immediately corrected it and he complained that day. He said, it is no good and Bhakti Chumaj was very downcast, of course. And he said, he apologized, did I use too much oil? I said, no, you have not used too much oil. You did not use enough chilies. The problem is never too much oil. The problem is not enough chilies. So he wanted, so there should be more chilies. Driving to Bombay, we were staying, this is before we ever had a temple in Bombay, and that really early, 1970, maybe November, and we were driving, and it was in the middle of a traffic jam. It was just going to that program of Sumati Maharaji's at Sindhya House. And we went into a traffic jam, and it was horrendous fumes, you know. In those days, there's no air-conditioned cars there, and it was horrible. And Prabhupada got sick to his stomach. When we came back, Prabhupada lay down, and he told me that, you know, we thought he was going to die. We thought he was going to leave his body. And we were... We were just so fearful, and Prabhupada was just, he was almost unconscious. And finally, Prabhupada said, bring me some rose water. So we brought him and poured him some rose water, mixed it in water, and Prabhupada drank it. And as soon as he drank it, within a one or two minutes, he sat up and he was normal. Completely recovered. I remember in Prabhupada's final days, it was so... Uh, Pishima, you know, she always used to keep Ganga Jal because she considered herself so contaminated that wherever she would sit when she would get up, she would sprinkle some Ganga Jal. Anywhere she would go, what she touched, she would put Ganga Jal because she considered herself so contaminated that she had to purify that place. So when Prabhupada was, you know, in his final days, 
she went to Prabhupada, and I was just amazed. She put her hand on Prabhupada's heart, just like a sister would do, loving sister. She put her hand on Prabhupada, and she was crying, and she put her hand on Prabhupada's heart, and she started to chant the Nishinga mantras for protecting Prabhupada. It was so touching. And then one day, Prabhupada said, just before this, Prabhupada said, you know, that she wants to cook for me. So I said, what will she cook? And he said, whatever she cooks, let her cook and serve it to me. So Kirtananda Maharaj was there, and he was like, you know, the senior person. He said, Prabhupada, you cannot eat what she cooks. She's going to cook everything in mustard oil. Prabhupada said, you know, whatever she cooks, it's all right. doesn't matter. So Pishima cooked his kachoris, which was, you know, Prabhupada was called kachori muka, one who's, his, his, he used to be called kachori muka, one whose mouth and face is always full of kachoris. So, uh, you know, we brought in the kachoris, and Prabhupada, I mean, at this point, Prabhupada could only drink liquids, right? Prabhupada started eating kachoris. He ate everything she cooked. And everybody thought, that's it, you know, Prabhupada may leave his body. No, no problem. Kirtananda Marsh left. <laughs> he, he gave up. Because he was like the, he was playing the role of like, you know, the stern doctor and like the elder. He was like a parent. And for Prabhupada didn't want to be controlled. So at that point he said, no, I will eat what I want to eat. Don't try to stop me. A lecture where Prabhupada said, you know, I have written these books, especially for my devotees. He said, it's not a question of just selling the books. He says, well, you must read the books. Another time we were at, in, in, uh, we were on, uh, 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 it was um, Marine Drive in Bombay. Rupanuga Prabhu, I believe, was there also. And he was visiting, he was a guest. GBC secretary would come in cycle one month of each year. And the issue came about wearing karmi clothes. And Prabhupada viewed in favor, it doesn't matter what they wear, whatever will best distribute the books. Another time, our Radha party, we decided to use incense packs as a warmer, you know, you can say a warmer, you know, to get the person warmed up. So a person would buy a pack of incense and then, you know, basically we would give them a book and ask for something further if they would give. So when this was told to Prabhupada, I told them what we were doing is that generally we usually gave about, you know, four packs of incense, four, a pack of incense for a dollar, and on the fifth pack of incense, we would get a little, give a big book, plus, you know, get a little bit of extra money. And each time we gave the pack, we give it back to Godhead. So Prabhupada was, that was reported to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, oh, this is not good. And he wrote a letter to, in response to, to Ramas for saying this should be stopped. I happened to show up that day in Bombay to take my turn as a secretary. And I, the secretary, Hans Duda, told me, you know, this letter is going out. I rushed into Prabhupada. I said, sure, Prabhupada, I don't mind. But then I have to say that our orders are going to be going down about 50%. Prabhupada stopped. He said, are you paying the book fund? I said, not only are we paying, we always have a credit. Then he called his secretary back and he said, destroy that letter. He said, never mind then. If you're paying for the books, okay. One time we were driving from Calcutta to Mayapur and uh, Gargamuni was driving and I was sitting in the front seat. You know, I always used to talk, to, you know, I talk with Gargamuni, we're friends, so I talk and probably would say, stop talking. But I, anyway, somehow or other, you know, just inadvertently start talking and sure enough, Gargamuni, you know, was driving and he was talking to me and he, saw him and he, he hit a farmer while he was driving and, you know, the guy went down on his bicycle and that was it. And immediately, we, we, you know, Gargamuni stopped the car, backed up, and all the farmers ran over and stuck their picks right against the tires and they started screaming. So Prabhupada was right at the door, leaning out the window and looking at the guy and he started talking to one of the farmers and then after about 10 minutes, Prabhupada said, Give him five rupees. And, you know, he reached and he gave him five rupees and he said, drive. And they took the picks away and we drove away. We looked back, the guy was still. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada was an expert, you know. Of course, I didn't talk after that. I didn't say a word after that. First and second canto Bhagavatams, especially Prabhupada wanted. Bhagavad Gita and first and second canto Bhagavatams. He liked the book distribution we were doing, 
At one point, I was complaining to Prabhupada that they're not printing. We were distributing so many books with the Radha Dhamma Prize. I said, Prabhupada, they can't keep up with our distribution. We, they must. He said, all right, don't worry. They were doing 20,000 at a time. He said, I will instruct them to print 50,000. He said, but one thing is that although they can't keep up with you, you can't keep up with me because I'm three canos ahead or two canos ahead of you both. He said, so I'm ahead of both of you. He got into the competitive mood. Regarding uh, Mayavadis, there's an indirect Mayavadi uh, meeting between a very famous person, a famous yogi who used to teach people how to meditate. He's well known. I won't even mention his name because Prabhupada said don't. Anyway, he has a big ashram in Rishikesh. So, when we went to Rishikesh, Prabhupada's arrival there was quite a big event because, you know, Rishikesh is the home of the Mayavadis. So, uh, as it turned out, many of the teachers of this famous yogi um, all came to talk to Prabhupada and to start coming to Prabhupada's darshans. And Prabhupada's darshans were brilliant. I mean, I don't know how Prabhupada did it because he was really ill, but they were brilliant. And uh, gradually, I think this, uh, you know, yogi became very, very concerned that all of his teachers were coming to Prabhupada. So one of them finally came with a message that, uh, Swamiji, you are very ill, so you should take rest and not exert yourself in this way where you will not be able to easily recover. And Prabhupada was so pleased with that. He said he has indirectly admitted his defeat. Another time we went to Bhaktivinoda Thakur's birthplace because Prabhupada was trying to negotiate to get that birthplace and the horn failed and Prabhupada had us take a, take us, take a dish, a plate, and, and leaning out the window, bang the plate with a metal spoon in replacement for the horn, because in India you don't you drive with a horn, so we're just out there the whole time banging on the side with a metal plate. So many ways, Prabhupada, you know, was the uh, master of time, <laughs> judge, expert judge of time, place, and circumstance. Knew what to do. Always knew what to do. The program we ever held, the, one of the main things Prabhupada was concerned in India, the books must be displayed, and he wanted someone to get up at some part, of, and they don't do this anymore in this kind. But he wanted someone to stand up and describe the books and what the, each book is about. That was supposed to be part of each program. You're supposed to hold up. One man was supposed to bring the books up and say, "This is this book about this. This is book book about this." And there would be a book table. No te program was complete if it didn't have a book table, and someone didn't uh, introduce the books to the public. And then he would say, you can go in the back and take a look at these books. The programs were meant for selling his books. The books were the basis. The books were the main thing. Because they can come and hear a lecture, but they may forget, but the book will remind them. At every program, Prabhupada insisted, we introduce the books. When one time we were going in Japan, Prabhupada asked me, when we were going to India, he said, if anyone challenges that I have used this name Prabhupada, he said, you should ask them, how many books have you printed? How many miles have you traveled? How many temples have you made? How many devotees have you made? He said, ask them that. He said, I should not say this. He said, but I can say it honestly. He said, I have inherited the property of my Guru Maharaj. Very strong. Krishna.